Well, good afternoon if you are on the East Coast of the United States. Good evening if you are in Offenbach, Germany or Domodossola, Italy. And greetings to people listening all over the world. It's Friday. I'm Fred Plotkin. So that means welcome to Fred Plotkin on Fridays on Adagio, the place where classical music happens. As you know, Adagio is a video and audio streaming platform dedicated to supporting artists and to making classical music and opera available to fans all around the world. Regular visitors know that I like to explore topics that I care about often with people I know very well or know slightly. The two gentlemen, I have two guests today. Um, I don't know at all, we've never met, but I was interested in what they do. So I got in touch for that reason and wanted to learn more about a topic that we all experience anytime we're near music, but I for one know nothing about. So today is a learning curve for me. We have Ed Mingo of the Parastro String Company. Is that the correct word, Parastro String Company? Parastro, it's actually Parastro GmbH. So um, German. Very German. Um, and it's actually the, the combination of two last names. Well, we'll get to that. But just the name of the company is Parastro, is Parastro GmbH. GmbH. Yeah. And we have Finnegan Shanahan, who must be of Irish background, I would guess. <laughs> he is a violinist, and I asked uh, Finnegan to join us today. Do you prefer Finnegan or Finn? I like both, but Finn is shorter, so we can go okay. with that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> is a violinist, and he is in a violin shop, the David Siegel Violin Shop in New York City. So if any of you hear any background sound, that's people doing business with stringed instruments, which is what we like. And Finn will demonstrate for us certain things on his violin and perhaps play something. And so what I wanted to begin with is the obvious, that we think of violins, violas, cellos, double basses, the classical stringed instruments as being from Italy and especially the city of Cremona, which is in the plain south of Milan. It's a beautiful city, a duchy. It has, um, I went as an undergrad at the University of Wisconsin and the University of Cremona has a relationship with the University of Wisconsin based on milk, that the <laughs> best dairying that happens in Italy is thought to happen in the province of Cremona. So they make beautiful cheeses, butters, lots of milk. Uh, there are cattle. Um, the cuisine is very rich, very delicious. It's not olive oil based. It's really butter based. The Po River goes near there. And therefore, you not only have the meat, but you have river fish, including sturgeon, which people never think of as being an Italian fish, but it's absolutely an Italian fish. Um, it's a beautiful town. It has Torone. Torone is sort of nougat. And the highest tower, bell tower in Italy, is in Cremona. And normally you would call it the Torone, the big tower, but not to confuse Nougat, they call it the Torazzo. And there's a wonderful museum of the violin, it's called Museo del Violino, in Cremona. Claudio Monteverdi was from there, the first great Italian opera composer. Uh, Ponchielli, who wrote La Gioconda, was from there. It's a city absolutely steeped in music and especially the culture of the stringed instrument. But we must, of course, acknowledge that stringed instruments didn't just happen in Cremona. They came from a tradition well before, going back at least to ancient Egypt. And we know that strings on lyres and other ancient instruments were made in ancient Egypt. So Ed Mingo, I would like to start with you and ask you to talk about ancient strings well before the violins and, and violas were crafted in Cremona. Okay, um, string making, like you said, started around 1500 BC, as far as we know, with the Egypt discovery of an Egyptian lute. And all strings, and I have an example of one here, from that time were what we call made out of 
gut. So they would use basically, you know, what they were slaughtering for food. So whether it was beef, lamb, goat, sheep, and they would use the intestines um, and dry them out and then turn them into that, <laughs> which mm -hmm. is basically a plain piece of gut that they would um, that they would stretch and cure and then polish and they would turn into specific thicknesses or gauges. So, you know, they would vibrate at pitch. Um, gut string making was actually very, very difficult and it was very, very time consuming. Um, and for the, for a, quite a while, the strings were actually more expensive than the instruments. So if you, you know, if you were a player, you at certain times would spend more money on a set of strings, uh, than you would on, on it on the instrument because uh it was a very very dirty process a lot of people got sick doing it um and it was also very time consuming to this day um this string that i'm holding right here this is a double bass g string um this from the beginning of the curing process to a finished product is still about a year for one string for one string uh -huh. so the curing process takes a very very long time <laughs> so you know i also write cookbooks and books of food history. And one of the things I love to muse about is who is the first person who tasted cheese or decided that what that hen left there with it looks like an egg, let's eat that or even a tomato and so forth. I wonder who it was who decided that the intestine of the lamb, the sheep in mm -hmm. Egypt well, let's not eat that, but let's see if we can turn it into something to make music with. Do we have any knowledge of how someone had the idea to take sheep intestines and make music with it? Not that I'm aware of. I mean, that's yeah. something that, you know, has been speculated for years, but nobody's really come up with an answer how it actually, you know, really first started. Well, I have to ask you now, because this is something that I've been wondering about for about 45 years. You always hear about cat gut. <laughs> Would you please set me and everyone straight about the use of cat intestines or not in the making of stringed instruments? OK, from what I've heard from, you know, our experts um, is that that was never true. That never really happened. Um, were, were they always because cat intestines are actually too small. Um, so all the actually today we only use uh, sheep um, for our gut. And, um, you know, so from what we understand, that, that's never really been true. It's always been kind of like a, a you know, a wife's tale, I guess. <laughs> OK. Um, or dog lover's tale. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so we know that the company was founded in 1798 by uh, Signore Giorgio Pirazzi and his sons mm -hmm. in the town of Domodossola. He was born in Domodossola in 1766. Yeah. Domodossola is, if you look at the map of Italy and you find Lago Maggiore in the northwest and you go beyond the lake, practically to the Swiss border, that's Domodossola. So more northern in Italy, you cannot get than Domodossola. <laughs> yeah. And it's near the historic French speaking zones and being near Switzerland, there's German speaking zones. Domodossola is very international. And yes, it's certainly Italy. It has an Italian name, but it feels like it's Central Europe, not Eastern Central Europe, like Austria, right. but Western Central Europe, like Switzerland, France, and so on. Uh, it's a very beautiful place. The food is terrific. <laughs> the nearby lake is beautiful. The town of Streza has one of the oldest music festivals in Italy and is just there. Um, the great conductor, John Andrea Nozeda, who was my guest in June, lives very close to there. It is, it's a heavenly spot. You have Alps mm -hmm. and lakes and, and really something very beautiful. And yet Giorgio was sent by his family down to Rome and to Naples, which are extraordinarily Italian and a very different flavor from Domodossola, to learn his trade. Now, would you talk, Ed, if you would, this would be about 1780. This was at a time when Italy was not the nation, the Republic of Italy, but many, many little zones and duchies and, and, and archbishoprics and so on. So that 
when Giorgio went from Domodossola, traveling through Lombardy and Tuscany and Liguria and Emilia Romagna, and perhaps um, Umbria to get down to Rome and then to Naples, he was going through many countries, many languages, many different cultures. So it must have been incredibly foreign in a way to him. Even the Italian spoken in Rome and Naples is very different, different from yes. the Italian in Domodossola. And I'm trying to imagine a 14-year-old boy in 1780 making this adventure. Do you know anything about how the family decided that from little Domodossola, he should go to the two largest cities on the Italian peninsula? I'm going to be honest. I really, um, there's not a whole lot of, of knowledge on that particular part of it. Um, most of the knowledge we have is when he moved the, the company to, to, to Germany. Okay, well, that I want to get to. Yeah, but I, but, I just um, want, yeah, I, I want I know, to know, know that the company has Italian DNA. Oh, yes, very much Italian lungs. DNA. <laughs> um, so then he did move to Germany because I know that he was told by people visiting the Modosla that there's a good environment in Germany for business, for music making and so on. But at that time, we still had living many of the world famous violin making families in Cremona. So yeah. I would have said, Giorgio, how come you're not going to Cremona and why are you going the opposite direction up to Frankfurt and then to Offenbach? Uh, from what I understand, the guilds in Italy wouldn't allow him to start a new company. Mm -hmm. And there was a landowner in Germany at the time who would allow him to have some land that was near a river. Um, it was uh, Offenbach on Main, which is the Main River. And we needed the river so we can make gut. You need, uh, you need running water so you can clean the gut thoroughly. So we needed property on a river. And there was a, a famous land baron in in Offenbach that allowed us to, you know, set up the company there. Mm -hmm. So when he moved to Offenbach and set up his company, eventually, I mean, I imagine that he had a market there, but it was probably a market in the German speaking world more than the Italian and the French speaking world, or am I mistaken? Um, I'm gonna be honest, I'm not a hundred percent sure. I believe, you know, you know, we've been selling strings throughout Europe you know, for, uh, for quite some time now. So, you know, once it started, I would assume it would have probably been through mostly Germany, but, you know, it, you know, was an Italian string maker with, with tradition. So, you know, and, you know, quality of the strings was very, very good right from the very be beginning. Well, we're going to get to that in about yeah. 30 seconds. I want to mention <laughs> one of my very dearest friends in Italy, lives in Florence and we Zoom because we've not seen each other now for a couple of years and he plays the violin. And I mentioned to Carlo that I was gonna be speaking to both of you today and being an Italian, he described it this way. He said, Pirastro is the Maserati of strings mm -hmm. <laughs> and something of very, very high quality. And I've known that I'm, I grew up playing the clarinet but I, I know string players and I've always known that about Pierastro, and obviously the name is Giorgio Pierazzi. In the 1890s, he was joined by a German partner, Theodore Strobel, so Pierastro, or the Stro. family was, he was dead. Would you talk about the transition from Pierazzi to Pierastro as a company? Yeah, um, I'm not sure exactly the year, but I do know that um, Theodore Strobel and Parazzi got together and they decided to, um, you know, join forces and, you know, expand the company. And so what they decided to do was combine their two last names to make the name Parastro. And then, um, you know, since then, you know, uh, Theodore Strobel, you know, basically, you know, left the company and then, you know, it's been Parastro ever since, but it's been run by a family member of the Parazzi family uh, to this day. So Ava they're Parazzi, now in the sixth generation. Sixth generation, yeah. yeah. Which is fabulous unto itself that you have this kind of tradition. We're yeah. talking a bit about the company, but now I want to get back to the materials. Okay. Um, you were talking about gut. Would you talk about how a string is made? Let's start with gut, but then we're going to get to the materials. And in my research, I noticed a phrase a lot, cure and stretch. 
Yep. What does that mean? Okay, so, you know, one of the, you know, so stream making back in the day, what they would do is to cure it, they would just hang it out in the open to let it dry out. So that's the curing process. And to make gut strings more consistent, now one of the biggest problems with gut strings was that it was pretty inconsistent. So every time they made it, said if they had good weather, you had a good string. If you had, if it was too humid, the string would stretch too much. If it was too dry, the string would be brittle. So that was always a factor. So you never knew which, how good your next set of strings were gonna be. So if you got a good set, you would try to keep it as long as you can. Um, what we do now in Germany to, to make the curing process more consistent is we actually, instead of curing it out in the open, we have rooms and the first room starts at about 80% humidity and the gut will hang from the ceiling and stay in there for about a month. And then after a month, it goes into the next room, which drops to 10%, 10%, 10%. That's why it takes about a year to finally get a string because you know the curing process takes so long. Uh, the other thing is like the stretching of it. Um, one of the first discoveries in string making is like, if you and I took this piece of gut and we just threw it in between each other and stretched it out, that string would actually, if you bowed it, would actually react immediately to the bow. So as soon as you bow that string, it reacted immediately. And one of the first things they discovered is if they took that same piece of gut and they twisted it, that would actually change how the string would perform under the bow. So now, because you twisted the string, you now made the string actually more flexible. People don't realize it. It's like two kids with a jump rope on, on mm -hmm. a school playground. You actually make the string more flexible, but what also does, it builds in what we call torsional resistance. So that's the twist of the string. And so now when the bow goes over, it actually fights the, the string, the string actually fights the bow more. So when it releases, you get more power and more energy. So th those are the two ways that they would actually make gut strings, you know, all the way from the beginning of string making up until about the time of Stradivari. So you address something that I, well, you address a lot of things. I'm going to start with two. One of them is the process you described is almost like making prosciutto, which <laughs> is an animal product in that you, after you've butchered the leg and you hang it in a environment with a certain degree of temperature and humidity, and you cover one end with salt and lard to protect it from oxidizing. And, but these are animal products and the prosciutto hangs usually for 14 months, the leg in different temperatures and humidities to get the mm -hmm. desired result. That's the first thing. The second thing is you spoke in passing because it's second nature to you about the use of a bow on a string. Let's talk about the fact that there are strings that are plucked and sometimes with a little um, pick. Yeah. And yeah. then there are strings that are bowed. Are those strings made differently? And I don't just mean guitars because I've, the pizzicato, I've heard yeah, pizzicato. violins plucked in yeah. certain. Yeah. So how, how do you, if you make the strings differently, how would you make them differently for plucking or for bowing? Uh, for the with gut strings, it's pretty much the same process for a plucked or a, or a, or a bowed string. Um, but when it start when you start getting into um, like harp strings, which are all plucked, mm. or guitar strings which are picked or strummed, um, but even uh, double bass strings, you know, you have a lot of <clears throat> what we call hybrid players, so players who play arco and pizzicato. So those strings are actually made the same. So there you can. It's the same string whether you're, you're bowing it or playing it pizzicato. But guitar strings and harp strings are very different where um, there's something on the outer part of the, which we haven't gotten to yet, on the outer part of a, a made string, it's called the windings. It's the metal mm -hmm. windings that go over it. On, on a lot of guitar strings or harp strings, they're round wound, which means it's just a round piece of wire that goes around. So the string is kind of rough to the feel where bowed strings need to be flat. So it's very, very smooth. Um, so that way you can bow over it. That's the major difference between a plucked string and, and a bowed, most plucked and bowed strings. There are variations, but not too many. So being a wind guy in preparing for this, I had not even thought about harps. Does yep. Perastro manufacture strings for harps? Absolutely, yeah. We've been, uh -huh. that's one of the strings we've been making for years, yep. So I was going to talk to you about four different strings and with Finnegan as well on violins, violas, and so forth. 
How many strings are on a harp? I don't even know. It depends on the harp. There are a couple of different types of harps. So there's, um, I don't know exactly how many, I'm going to be honest. Um, that's not my particular uh, forte, but you know, there's the folk harp and the orchestral harp. The orchestral harp yeah. is huge. Um, and I don't know how many, it's, I think it's got like four or five octaves. It's, 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 it's a large. <laughs> a dear family friend of mine played for decades and decades and decades the harp and mm -hmm. her husband also a dear friend of mine and work colleague played timpani in the metropolitan opera orchestra mm -hmm. and the two of them had purpose-built cars for for their Dick <laughs> richard to be able to transport his timpani in his vehicle and bernice a small woman to transport this enormous harp in her vehicle and it was quite the sight to see them driving in New York City with these strange looking vehicles, Cars, but really yeah. they were intended for the transportation of very large musical instruments. Um, so the materials began to evolve and change. And I know, I know that Perastro was a big part of that mm -hmm. evolution. So by 1900, there was a, a string that had a solid steel core Correct. which I gather yeah. has better tuning. It's probably easier to manufacture. Yep. Talk about the evolution of strings. And I guess the big question is, I assume that you still manufacture gut strings for those who want them. Absolutely. Actually, uh, we're the last manufacturer, uh, mass producer of gut strings left in the world. Um, there are a few boutiques, smaller companies that make, you know, small um Batch, batches of, you know, specially made gut strings, but we're the last mass producer of violin, viola, cello, and double bass gut strings in the world. Um, one of the things about the gut strings, what happened around what was going on with the, the gut strings, I'm just going to kind of go back a little bit because you want to hear about the evolution. Um, one of the things that happened was the problem with uh, gut strings, you know, the, the and how it kind of changed how we uh, modern to, to modern instruments was um, right around the time of Stradivari. What was happening was um, one of the biggest problems was to getting cello C strings. And at the time, like Dragonetti only played a, a three string bass. So the problem was they couldn't get gut, um, make a piece of gut thick enough that would dry properly and vibrate at pitch. And it was really difficult to make a cello C and it was um, impossible to make a, a bass E string because it would have to be a huge piece of gut. So what happened around 1700 with Stradivari is they actually used copper wire because it was the first metal they were able to get thin enough and they wrapped the copper wire onto the gut to make the wound strings. And that was made so we can add more mass to the string so the string would vibrate at pitch. So that's when Dragonetti and, you know, basses started going to four strings. If you look at a lot of old Baroque pictures of quartets, uh, especially from the, like the mid 1700s, you'll notice that the cello C string in some of the paintings might be gold. That's because it was copper. Mm -hmm. Right around 1900, they came out with the solid steel core string, which is basically, you know, your, um, your guitar string um, now, but it's literally just, it's really hard to see in here, but it's just a thin little piece of metal that we wind on. And what that did for music back, because strings were so expensive up, up to that point, you know, it was basically, you know, if you had money, you could play the violin. Or if you had some talent uh, and somebody was able to sponsor, you could play the violin. But now that they were able to make strings out of steel and they stayed in tune a lot better, they lasted a lot longer, they were really cheap to make, they can make a lot of them quickly. Um, they were really, really durable. Um, so they were able to, you know, the, the problem with them was playing pieces of steel like this, you can't twist, you can't get, get different bow feels. And so, um, and- What do you mean by a feel. bow feel? What's a bow feel? So what I mean by bow feel is how the string would react under the bow. Remember I was talking about the twist. So when I was saying, you know, certain strings react quickly and a steel core string is gonna react immediately once the bow goes over it where if you twisted the gut, you know, it would react slower. So you got more volume. Mm -hmm. So you can't vary the bow feel or the reaction time of, of a steel core string. So it would react immediately, immediately under the bow. So it really 
it didn't sound like a gut string, but this is when a whole new type of player came. This is where fiddlers came around, Celtic music, you know, all the different fiddle styles really developed out of the, the, the introduction of gut strings to the market because now a whole new group of players were able to afford instruments and afford strings. And maybe uh, if you want to talk to Finn, he can, I know Finn well, does I was actually fiddling. about to go to Finn. Um, so <laughs> Finn, at the ready, please. Um, I, I want to start questions with you and I imagine you have a violin in hand. Is that true? I sure do. <laughs> Let's see it, please. Here it is. And I'm going to ask my engineer in Germany to let me see Finn primarily and not Ed for the moment. If that's possible. Let's see if I can do that. There we oh, go. There you Thank go. you, sir. So um, because I'm a wind guy, all of this is quite new to me. So speak to me as if you were explaining it to someone who has never touched a violin because I have, but not much. Um, would you talk about the different parts of the violin? We see the strings, but talk about the other major parts. Sure, yeah. Um, so the modern violin, the way that it was, uh, the way that it exists today, um, it, essentially the same as it existed in the time of Stradivarius and, and, um, and even, you know, almost since Amadi, I would say. It's generally thought to be like the beginning of the modern violin. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, those instruments were all Baroque instruments, and so, um, <clears throat> which are very different, um, not just in terms of the strings, but primarily also in terms of the neck length. Um, so a lot of instruments that exist today, Neck meaning? Um, that, I'm, I'm really going to ask basic questions because sure. I'm not. Sure. Finn, try to speak neck. a little louder. I'm going to ask you to speak a little louder. Sure thing. Yeah. So Thank the you. neck, the neck meaning this part. So the same as on a guitar or a, uh, any other stringed instrument um, where you finger the strings. Um, so older instruments from that time period, classical period instruments uh, had shorter necks and instruments that exist now from that time period had to be converted from Baroque instruments into modern violins uh -huh. by changing the neck. So the scroll remains the same and the body remains the same. Um, that's so would you show us the bottom part of the violin and where the strings are attached at the bottom? Okay. Sure thing. And that's called a chin rest, a chin guard? This is called a chin rest. So that's where your chin sits. Uh, this is the tail piece, mm -hmm. literally cola tail, and yeah. um, and that's where the strings uh, are attached to. So um, that when you are tuning an instrument, that means that you are tightening the strings to the appropriate, well, you tell me rather than me guessing. Sure. You're tightening the string to the appropriate pitch. Um, okay. And on an instrument like violin, for instance, there's no, there's a uh, standard tuning, which is starting on the lowest string, G, D, A, E. Mm -hmm. But depends on what type of music you're playing, there's all sorts of different tunings that people use, whether it's so, I guess my, or Arabic music. Yeah. My next question, and it could be for Ed, but if you know the answer, please tell me, Finn. Um, when we talk about a G string, a D string, an A string, and an E string, G being the lowest, it's below middle C, I gather, is that G? And how is the string made to be in G or is it meant to be turned so that it's in G? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, go maybe, ahead. Ed can, maybe Ed can take this one from a physics standpoint. Okay, yeah, we actually, answer. every string is actually meant because in order for a string to play in tune, um, we need to know certain things when we are making a string. We need to know what we call the vibrating string length. So if Finn can hold the violin up real quick. Um, the vibrating string length of, a, of an instrument is the measurement from the nut, which is where Finn's finger is, to the bridge, which, oh, over oh, there it is, Finn. Um, that measurement is what we call, that's where, when the, when the string is played, that's where the vibration is. So we need to know that specific length, how thick the string needs to be, and how much mass, so uh, density needs to be on the string in order to vibrate and pitch. So yes, all of our strings are specifically made. So when they are 
at pitch when they're tuned to the right tension to vibrate in tune. So detuning strings will create, can create some issues. <laughs> okay. So yes, all, all strings are made to be played at a specific pitch. Got it. So I'm going to go back to Finn. Um, I, in my research, discovered that the violin, the strings from low to high are G, D, A, E, viola, A, D, G, C, cello, C, G, D, A, double Brit bass, G, D, A, E. Um, so therefore, on the violin, and explain this not just to me, but to our listeners, if you are playing a piece of music that's in A major, what is your thought process and your physical process to make that happen on the violin? That's a really good question. Um, depending on what key you're playing a piece in, your hand is, is fitting into different, totally different shapes on the violin. Um, and so if you're in A major, you're fingers are going to be making uh, different shapes than they would in a different key. Also, if you're shifting up into a different um, position, your fingers will end up in different shapes than they were in, a, you know, in first position, if you're starting in first position for even just one key. Mm -hmm. um, and by, you know, just to clarify what, by finger position or finger shape, what I mean is, like how far your fingers are apart from, from one another. They're never always the same distance apart. Um, and then, you know, to like take that one step further, um, compared to guitar or an, an equal tempered instrument, violin is not equal tempered, nor is uh, viola or cello. What does equal bass. tempered mean? Mm -hmm. Equal temperament was uh, invented in, I think in the 1800s, maybe late. Yeah, someone there. Oop. was Intros. basically a method yeah it was basically a method that was established to be able to transition from key to key more easily um but any type of folk music that you hear from around the world from any anywhere in the world pretty much and that's going to be older than 200 years old so uh is not an equal temperament um and pretty much what this ends up meaning is that the sound quality of certain chords is completely different uh, because the distances in between notes, so interval distance, is different. Um, when you're using, uh, when you're not using equal temperament, um, you could consider it some sort of uh, just intonation, which is, there's many definitions of that, but just intonation basically um, deals with perfect mathematical ratios. So uh, certain pitches that are resonating at certain frequencies corresponding very nicely and neatly in terms of the physics, you know, behind what you're hearing. Um, so I'm going to ask yeah. you to pick up your bow and just play a long bowing on the G string, then on the D string, then on the A, then on the E separately. So we get a sense of the sound of these different strings on the bow. Sure. All right. So what do you as a musician hear when you do that? Um, I would say the best answer that I can come up with that is that I hear not just the note or the pitch, but I hear the timber of the, the note. And so basically that's the sound quality, the tonal quality of it. Um, and Ed was talking before about uh, retuning strings that are, that are basically made to be a certain pitch changes the sound quality um, and can cause, you know, can create certain issues. Um, and, the reason for that is the timbral quality changes dramatically when you retune a string that was made for a certain pitch. Um, with positive and if you were to results. play your bow on the D and the A together, or any two of the strings, but let's say the D and the A, let's hear what that sounds like, and then I'll ask you what you hear when you do that. 
Sure, yeah. What do you hear? <laughs> I was also tuning in the middle of that. So that okay. <laughs> the explanation for why the pitch changed. Um, yep. What I'm hearing is like on a, on a, um, uh, it becomes more complex, the, the sounds that you're hearing. Um, and the reason for that is uh, there's lots of overtones happening that are very, very subtle whenever you're hearing a pitch, especially of a vibrating string. And so when you combine two strings, it's like multiple, it's, you know, exponential. You hear a lot more um, harmonics and harmonic overtones. So very complex uh, timbers. So this leads to a fundamental question about performance, and it comes in all different forms. Uh, I know opera singers who, when they're on the stage, they sing, but they don't listen to themselves so to speak. They're in the moment. Uh, they listen, we hope, to their colleagues so that they know when to come in and so forth. I know many orchestral players who listen to one another and follow the conductor usually in the act of making music collectively. As a soloist on a, on a stringed instrument in this case, do you listen as you're playing or do you play? And the reason I ask is because if you decide in the middle of playing that a string might be a little out of tune, but you can't stop to tune it while you're playing, do you then compensate for that being slightly out of tune to play differently? What do you do in terms of listening while performing? Sure, yeah. So the first answer to that question is thinking about it in terms of um, technique. Um, Yes, definitely thinking, definitely listening to yourself very closely as you're playing in terms of intonation and things like that, you can correct much more quickly if you're really using your ears. Um, but if you're not playing with other people, uh, you, you definitely, your ears have a very different relationship to what you're doing. Um, I would say in, in either situation, whether playing alone or playing with others, there is so much uh, physically happening with instrumentalists um, in terms of um, how they're using their body. So muscle memory, but also literally the vibrations of the sounds that they're making. Um, and so there's a lot to pay attention to in terms of feel and like the, um, I guess proprioception is probably a good word, which is the sort of sensation of being in between your four limbs as a, as an instrumentalist is a, uh, is huge. So there's there's that whole side to it as well that sometimes you can totally get lost in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would you favor us with a little performance of whatever you'd like to play? And if you want, not only tell us the music, but how you approach this particular piece of music using the violin and the strings that you have with you. Sure. Yeah, I think it might be best um, I was thinking of playing through several different styles of music. Uh, one thing we didn't talk about so much yet, we got into it a little with steel strings, but is that strings are incredibly specialized. So if you're playing one specific kind of music, sure, you can have different colors from different strings. And, you know, some strings are warmer, some are brighter, focus and all of that. Um, however, certain strings lend themselves very well to certain types of music. Um, steel strings lend themselves very well to bluegrass and folk music sometimes and then uh, you know gut strings lend themselves very well to baroque music that's why people mm -hmm. still use that use gut strings or gut core strings um, and that's all wonderful that very all good and well when you want to have very specialized things however if you play a lot of different kinds of music you don't want to be changing your strings every day. So for me as a, as a violinist, I've always used strings that are extremely flexible and let me play lots of different kinds of music without sounding iffy on certain types of music and better mm -hmm. than others. Um, and yeah, the, I mean, I'm right now I have per astro, I have perpetual strings on my violin. And that's it's one of the only types of strings that, that has done that. Uh, 
And so I play a lot of different kinds of music and uh, am a composer as well. So that's, that's an important thing for me as a player. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to, I'll, I'll go through a few things. Please do. You, you narrate your work and, and we're honored to have you play. Thank you. Okay. I'll just start with one style and I'll just go into some different ones. Thank you. So talk about what you just did. Can you say that one more time? Sorry, I just put my... my I said in. thank you and please talk about what you just did. Oh, sure. You're very welcome. Um, yeah, I just kind of just tried to go through a few different styles. So I started with... Uh, first thing I played was Bartok Rhapsody. So something very romantic and more demanding, like classically from a certainly in terms of classical music more demanding repertoire um and more dynamic uh in terms of uh in terms of loud and soft and all sorts of variety and then i was playing a little bit of gypsy music a little bit of irish uh music some bebop charlie parker mm -hmm. um and uh bluegrass tune i think that was rocky top I haven't played bluegrass in a while, but I that, you know, a little bit of bluegrass and then uh, just played uh, some solo uh, Bach as well at the end. And how was your approach different if it was different as you played the different types of music using the same violin and the same perpetual strings? Sure, yeah. Um, I would say even within styles, even like within classical music, this is true, but certainly across styles, <clears throat> your, your, um, your right hand, your bow arm is really the biggest, uh, 
has the most dramatic difference between styles. Um, certain styles, rhythm is a lot more important than other styles, or a lot more, uh, like keeping the motor of the music going is a lot more a part of it. And so um, downward motion is a lot more important. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, fiddle players holding their violin down here and playing like this. I don't know if you can see that. I can play a little bit like that for you. Okay. Like. Yeah. And how is it different when you hold it lower? Is uh, it the body dynamic is different or, or what happens? Yeah, there's a kind of a um, common misconception that fiddle players holding their, holding their fiddles down low like that is like not having learned proper technique or, or just because the music is more casual or something. But actually it's because rhythm is extremely important for that kind of music. So if your arms already are down nice and low you have all this downward motion. It's almost like playing piano mm -hmm. or something where there's a lot of gravity to the, the music. So it's really all about gravity. Same reason guitarists sometimes, a you know, certain era of guitar playing, hold the guitars, you know, extremely low, you know, for certain, yeah. certain types of playing. Um, I live in a neighborhood in New York City where I'm between Juilliard, Manus, and mm -hmm. the Manhattan School of Music. And there are a lot of violin students in my neighborhood. And I can always spot them because they have an indentation here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you don't have that unless you're wearing makeup. Or do you? Okay. Is I that, sure I mean, do. it's kind of like the mark of Zorro, the mark of Violino, in that I always know who are violin or perhaps viola players. When you began studying, were you warned that you were going to get this uh, <laughs> violin tattoo? No, not at all. That's just, it, it comes with being a violinist. Although, you know, playing in, when I was studying as a, as a violinist, playing like many hours a day, it, it has a much different effect than now when I, I'm a working musician and I play violin professionally, uh, but I also play, I also compose music and I play a lot of other instruments. And so I'm not spending hours and hours playing violin. Got it. You know, at so, this point in my life, so it's not as much. Being named Finnegan Shanahan, one could guess that you have Irish roots. Where did you grow up and where did you study? I have Irish roots, but, you know, somewhere somewhere back there. I didn't, uh, I don't have any immediate uh, relatives, right, for, you know, from Ireland. But um, I grew up in uh, the Hudson Valley, upstate. New York. Uh, north, of, north of New York City, yeah, about two hours north of New York City. And I studied... Actually, I didn't go far uh, when it came time to, to go to conservatory and study violin. I studied at Bard College. Mm -hmm. So in my view, you went very far because Bard is an excellent school. So clearly, um, that is part of your pedigree. The reason I ask about your Irishness is because there's the whole Irish fiddle tradition. Uh, that's a very evolved thing. And I, Have you been to Ireland? I've never been to Ireland, but when I started violin, I, Irish music was the first type of, I was learning like Irish music and Suzuki violin. Okay. You know, Suzuki when you plan to go, let me know. A few months ago, I had the head of the Royal Irish Academy of Music on, Deborah <laughs> Kelleher. And uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful musical environment in Ireland of all types. And they produce outstanding artists. Mm -hmm. Um Can viol yeah. obviously I was my question is can violin be taught? Obviously it can be taught, but what are the secrets that has to be that have to be passed on? What I mean, obviously you learn the technique, you learn the manual elements. I've learned from you now that there's a lot of listening going on, but every violinist I know has his or her very distinct sound. Uh, their physical relationship to the instrument. It's a very personal, almost sexual thing to watch violinists and all string players 
with their instruments and the way they caress them, the way with the cello they surround them. Um, it's almost an embrace. And, and many violinists I've seen, it feels like it's an extension of their voice coming out from them. And I've been hearing violinists since I'm a very little boy. I think the first I heard was the Polish violinist, Henrik Shearing. But I've heard so many that um, I'm just fascinated by this process that was not part of my musical upbringing as, as a musician, but it seems a whole other world to me. It's so very exotic and very appealing. Talk about the secrets if you want to share them. Sure. I mean, uh, my, my immediate uh, thought from that question is about the voice, um, violin and viola and particularly cello, the, has, they've been studied. The similarity between those instruments and the human voice is extremely, uh, are, um, are, are many, many similarities. Um, and it's, I think cello is the closest instrument to the human voice um, in terms of the, the timber, uh, the tonal quality. Um, and so that's not a, a mistake that, you know, maybe stringed instruments are, have that have that sort of, you know, people perceive string instruments as being quite an extension. Um, another part of it is that you're using your body in a very, um, physically speaking, you're using your body in a very um, multitasking way. Um, even I would say even more so than percussion, because there's something a little unnatural about the way that you have to hold your body and use your body for a string instrument um, in a way that, for instance, percussion is extremely natural. Um, and so you have to be doing totally different things with your hands. And, uh, you know, ideally, they're talking to each other in some on some level or another. Mm -hmm most important things I learned that you could consider a secret is how much one hand communicates with the other hand as a, mm. uh, as a string player. And so working on something particularly difficult where you wouldn't think, um, you know, something very difficult in your left hand uh, that maybe seems to have nothing to do with your right hand, but, um, you know, actually going a little bit deeper with, uh, mastering whatever's going on in your right hand will create a lot more um, flexibility and ease in your left hand. And so they, they really communicate. You remind me of something. Uh, for decades, we had in New York City a wonderful musical organization called the Opera Orchestra of New York that was directed by Eve Queller. Um, listeners, can, if you Google Fred Plotkin and Eve Queller, you can find a class that I did with her a few years ago at New York University. And she's a great, great uh, proponent of finding works in, of opera that are less known, but she also conducts um, non-operatic music. And in the Opera Orchestra of New York, one of the first chairs, not the concert master, but the person next to the concert master was a, a man, a violinist, who I guess was left-handed because he held his violin and the chin rest and everything was on the opposite side from every other violinist I've ever seen. And I'm guessing, I don't know that the string order might've been reversed. I don't know, maybe you can tell me, but we always assume that a violinist will have the instrument in his or her left hand and the bow in the right. What happens when this reversal takes place? And have you ever come across other people who have that preference? Uh, yeah, totally. I have that the lefty instrument is a, it's a real thing, but it's not a very common thing. I would say it's quite rare, um, especially in like chamber music settings, you know, ensemble settings. It's, it's pretty rare. Um, and in, in classical music, particularly, I'd say it's slightly more common um, in, in other types of, of music. There are plenty of uh, lefty violinists, you know, people who are lefties as writers, you know, hand, hand mm -hmm. And I've talked a lot. I'm, I happen to be righty, but I, I'm a teacher and I've talked a lot with some of my students that are lefty. And that's, uh, it's interesting because some things do feel harder 
at first, like at very beginning stages. Um, but really what you're doing with your hands is so foreign uh, with a stringed instrument that eventually it becomes its own challenge that's kind of independent of that. Do you know if the strings are in reverse order on the lefty violin? Yeah, they are. So okay. everything is mirror image, you know, so it's uh -huh. uh, instead of the high string, um, the high string is, in, in other words, the high string is always, uh, if we're talking outside and inside, it's always on the inside. Okay. Yeah. So the very famous violinist Midori, when she was a girl, and I, I'm sure this exists on video, it could be found on YouTube and elsewhere, um, was playing, I believe, but I'm not certain with Leonard Bernstein, but with a very famous conductor. And in the middle of the concerto that she was playing, a string broke. And she was a teenager, perhaps even younger. Um, she simply adapted to having three strings. She pulled it out, the, the broken string, and played on three. What happened, what has to be done in terms of accommodating the absence of one of the strings in terms of the way you play the written music on your remaining three strings? Um, I think, I don't actually, I didn't know that that happened, but that's, I, I've heard of stuff like that happening. Um, pretty much totally depends on the music you're playing. Uh, depending on the music, it could actually be not too much of a feat to do that. Um, other than the fact that it's completely surprising and would throw, it would throw me off completely to be in a concert and have that happen. Um, but uh, I've played enough music where I'm playing in bars and stuff like that, where I probably would be more ready for it than some. But mm -hmm. um, but also, you know, there's some music that you really would have to stop if that happened and you wouldn't, there's no way to really make it happen. Um, certainly if the music is improvised, it's a lot easier to, to just, you know, roll with the punches, things like that happening. But um, yeah, particularly uh, cool story that it was a yep. concerto, you know. Yep. It was probably, you know, the Mendelssohn, the Tchaikovsky, one of the, the Beethoven, perhaps one of the very famous concerti that we all know every note to. And she just kept going. She didn't stop. I'm not certain it was Bernstein. It could have been Meda Ozawa, but conductors of that generation. And um, it made her career because it's kind of like when uh, an athlete who we don't know comes in and suddenly takes over from the injured star athlete and, and has a huge success. I know that you have to get going in a couple of minutes. Did I leave anything out that I should have asked you? Uh, I don't think you did. I didn't really talk too much about, um, we talked a little bit about the just anatomy of the violin, but in terms of strings, uh, and, and we also, I also talked a little bit about styles of music and certain strings being good for certain styles of music. But I also, uh, I didn't really talk too much about uh, what a different strings make, even if you're playing one kind of music and you have the right set of strings or the right type of string for that music. Um, what, what difference do strings make uh, even beyond that point? Um, and really like the, the, the short answer of it is uh, in terms of flexibility and, and um, in terms of uh, I think Ed was talking about this earlier with steel strings speaking very quickly, um, uh, especially compared to gut strings. Um, and yeah, be being able to have focus and clarity with articulation is a big thing with stringed instruments um, mm -hmm. that, that everybody wants, no matter what the style is or what the, um, what the uh, character of sound is that you're, that you're working with with your instrument. One last question. I know, and I know you know, that viola players, who I find very soulful and appealing, are the butt of all kinds of jokes. Uh, I happen to respect viola players because one of my very favorite composers is Hector Berlioz, who had a very strong feeling for the viola and composed a lot for it. Uh, Paganini played the viola, one of the most famous string players of all. And um, Berlioz wrote 
Harold in Italy, he wrote other pieces for viola. When I'm not going to go into the viola jokes because we don't have to, but when you as a composer think about the music that you want to write and express, does the violin come in your ear automatically or do you hear viola as a lead voice at certain times? Talk about your composing process and how you select a particular instrument to carry the lead melody. Um, uh, so composers approach this very differently depending on uh, how important <clears throat> sound is to them, you know, the aesthetic of, of sound. Um, I actually am a violist as well. I didn't okay. bring a viola to play, but I am a violist um, and I do prefer uh, in terms of solo repertoire and playing music for my own enjoyment, I prefer playing viola. Um, I like the timber of it more. So do I. Um, yeah. yeah. And, uh, but I would say as a composer personally, I uh, am much more like, uh, much more um, in tune with like process versus product. And so something I, that I always think about when I'm composing is, is function. Um, how the instruments are going to function, um, what they can do, what the capacity of those instruments are to, to, um, to be inside of that music rather than just what sound quality I want. So that's the short answer for me. I, c I come at it from the other direction a little bit. Well, Finnegan Shanahan, thank you for teaching us. I know you have to go and I appreciate you and also the David Siegel Violin Shop in New York City for giving you the space to do this for us. And I look forward to hearing you soon. And I'm going to go back now to Ed Mingo. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so, Ed, <laughs> um, what did Finn say that caught your particular attention that you would want to expand on? Oh, there's plenty of things. Um, I mean, you know, uh, we just kind of phrase on the subject of the different materials and how they affect sound. And um, that one of the things about, you know, Parastro in particular is we have probably the widest variety of strings um, of all the string companies. And the reason for that is we truly believe that every instrument, every player is different. Um, so, you know, certain violins have different sounds over other violins. So to us, there's no one size fit at all. And especially when you add the bow and the bow weight, and then you add a player who might, you know, Lynn Harrell's pinky was about the size of my thumb and he was just Cello a player. Yeah. massive mm -hmm. player. And just, he really had a very, very strong bow arm. And like you were saying before, he would tuck the, the, the cello, the C peg, underneath his chin and move with the instrument. He was very, very fluid with his instrument. So, you know, com comparing him to, to like a Yo-Yo Ma, which is a completely different, you know, um, every player is a little bit different. Every style is a little bit different. So that's why we make so many different types of strings is because, you know, especially with um, viola, cello and uh, double bass, that's really where a lot of the big differences come in. Because uh, what a lot of people don't realize is violin is very standard. Every violin is about is 14 inches. Um, it's got the same vibrating string length every time. So with the violin, you can make almost a one size fits all string. So a lot of the strings we sell for violin are what we call medium. So the, the regular gauge, uh, which means the thickness of the string. With uh, viola, cello, and bass, um, you're dealing with very different bodies lengths and sizes and also varying vibrating string lengths. So with um, viola and cello bass, we need to make strings of different thicknesses. So we'll call them, you know, some people call them light and strong, or we call them Vike and Stark for German, Dolce and Forte, they're also called, but those are specifically like coffee. made. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're specifically made, you know, uh, the longer an instrument is, actually the thinner the string needs to be. So a longer instrument might need a lighter gauge string where a shorter instrument um, would actually need a thicker string. So for us, one of the difficult things for us is actually making student strings because student strings being so small, we have to come up with a balance between being thick enough to vibrate at pitch, 
but easy enough for the kid to still be able to press down on the strings and make make a sound. If the strings are too heavy, they can't do it. So, you know, to uh, you know, we have to make our student strings cheaper, you know, for for a budget, but they're actually harder to make than full size strings. <laughs> um so I wanted to get to Finn while he was still available, but we were in 1900 with you and then I think the next leap forward is around the 1940s when there 40s. was nylon and uh, uh, actually kind of jump one yep. um from the 1940s after in 1940s they came out with this was called a rope core string mm -hmm. so instead of being one piece of steel as the core it's actually like four or five well not it would be five or seven or nine it has to be an odd number strands of steel that they would use at the core and what this did is got us back to gut technology where now we can twist it so it's called the rope core string or the rope steel core string. And this became very, very popular for double bass and for cello on the G and C strings. This is um, really pretty much almost every orchestral double bass player, not every, but a lot of them. Um, and I wanna say about 80% of cellists use a rope core on the G and C. And what that did is got us back to to being able to twist the core to get different bow feels. So, um, one of the things you'll see with strings is some, especially with cellos, you'll see uh, what they'll call a medium and a soloist string. Uh, a medium string it will have a lower twist, so it's easier to bow that way, because that player wants to blend. That player is an orchestral player, wants to blend with the orchestra. And a soloist string, a lot of times on the GNC, will have more of a twist because now the player is gonna be able to dig into the string more to get more power. So that's how we can you know, really vary with using the twist to get different feels for different bow, you know, for different bowings and, and different players. So if you're a soloist, you need to project, you, you know, buy a soloist string most of the time. And then, you know, if you want to blend, you're gonna you, you're gonna buy it, purchase a string that has a lower, you know, twist or tension so they can, you know, blend better with the orchestra. But I and did that want was to around get back. 1940. <laughs> yeah, okay. But from what I gather from my research, and correct me if I'm wrong, also in the 1940s, a nylon core string was introduced for classical guitar. Classical and, guitar, correct. Yeah. And I guess that surprised me because in the 1940s, during World War II and right after, there was a famous nylon shortage because women wanted nylon stockings and they couldn't get them. Correct. And, yep. Yet nylon at that point was being used to make strings for guitars. Correct. Uh, what happened? Um, one of the more famous uh, classical guitar players, Andrea Segovia, mm -hmm. uh, he was playing parastro gut strings, as a matter of fact, um, gut guitar strings. And during World War II, the uh, the entire parastro fa factory was actually completely bombed. So it was yeah. it, it was destroyed during because in Offenbach, we're just outside of Frankfurt. We were just outside of the Frankfurt airport. Um, so the, the, the company was the building was completely destroyed during World War Two. So for a while, um, you know, Segovia couldn't get his his gut guitar strings. So we actually turned to a little company in New York, um, Augustine, uh, who was you know, experiment with the, with the first, you know, nylon, which is fishing line, uh, guitar strings. Mm. <laughs> um, and that's really how that got started. Um, the problem with the, this is like we were talking before with a pluck string and, uh, and a bowed string. The problem with, with those, those older guitar strings is where they were what we call a monofilament. So just one piece of nylon as the core. So it's just a solid piece of nylon. And if you tried to bow that, it just rolled. It didn't work. It just rolled under the bow. So we were unable to make uh, nylon strings for violin until almost 1970. Mm. And then in the post-war era, uh, steel came into use. And I guess what I'm gleaning here is that as styles evolved, as musical styles evolved, mm -hmm. as um, guitars were electrified, as in some cases violins yeah. were even electrified, um, suddenly the way the strings had to work was different according to the music that had to work. So as you described, basically, there's a menu of strings. Oh, yeah. Yep. Uh, yes, and go ahead. 
Yeah, and really, uh, what are the other things that affect it is um, like for players, like uh, many players tell me, you know, you know, being from New York, uh, playing Carnegie Hall, you could pretty much play almost any string you want because the acoustics of Carnegie Hall are just so fantastic that you can play gut strings in Carnegie Hall and they still fill, fill the hall. Mm -hmm. um, but playing at the new Geffen Hall, uh, it's a slower room. So players yeah. were using different strings for that for that room because, it, you know, it, it, you had a different feel. Uh, the other things that happen is sometimes you have the leader of one section can be different and it'll, it'll affect the entire orchestra. One of the best examples of that is the Boston Symphony is very no, known for their bass section and their bass section. They all use um, the principal bass player of that section insists that every player uses original flexicore bass strings, which are our oldest, most powerful bass string to get that real thump, thump sound. Mm -hmm. So they have a really loud bass section, which makes the cellist have to use a different string, which makes the violist have to use a louder string. So I can almost tell a bass player um, where they're from by what strings they're using mm. <laughs> because of the rooms and, you know, just different tastes. Um, even like sometimes the luthier will have a, a big influence on, you know, the taste of, you know, what's going on, you know, for a long time, there was what they called the New York setup. And it was a specific setup of strings that was used in New York. And that was kind of started by um, a gentleman named Rene, Rome Rene Morel, who ran the shop on 54th street for many, many years. And it was, everybody used that setup for a very long time, including, you know, some of the more famous players. I, a number of years ago with the pandemic, I lose track of what year is which, but um, I, I did some work and research with the Philadelphia Orchestra okay. and the Philadelphia Orchestra has the famous Philadelphia sound. Mm -hmm. And I discovered that part of that is that the Wanamaker department store where the family were big music lovers that had an organ um, paid for and basically collected about 65 classic stringed instruments many of them from italy yeah. that were handed down when a player would leave the orchestra he or Correct. she would pass it to the next uh incoming musician so that the sound was unified by the fact that the instruments were a constant which yep. ma makes it a bit different from orchestras where each player will have his or her instrument that goes wherever they go and with the strings that they use Right. Um, I, I mean, the mind runs wild with the concept of how an orchestra can sound different if each of the, let's say, 30 or 40 string players has his or her own preference for instrument, for strings. And then if you have a music director and he or she um, has a sound in their heads, but then you have a, <coughs> excuse me, a guest conductor come in. And what if that person has a very distinct, different. different sound? Let's take a work like Strauss's Metamorphosen, which is all string. Mm -hmm. I believe it's 36 instruments. I don't want to be quoted on that. Imagine how a Kurt Mazur from the German tradition may conduct Metamorphosen instead of, say, a James Levine, who may have a different feeling for it. Um, this means that we can hear the same piece of music right. with different musicians, different orchestras, different instruments, different conductors, and experience it anew each time. And I mention this primarily because I know that many people say, oh, well, I've heard Metamorphosis, and I don't have to hear it again. Mm. Or I've heard <laughs> the yeah. Brahms cello concerto, or Dvorak, or whatever. This means that we have an ongoing, if we're smart, have an, I, an ongoing relationship with music for our whole lives. And we Absolutely. return to these pieces. Um, tell me about you. How did you get involved? How did you get all strung up? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's kind of a, all right, I'm going to be honest. I'm a, I'm a jazz guitar player. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, started, I started as a jazz guitar player, um, you know, went to school for jazz guitar and got my performance degree. And I wound up working at um, a local wholesaler who we sold guitar picks, but we sold everything, drumsticks, reeds for clarinets and, and, and saxophones, uh, you name it, we sold it, um, including violin strings. 
And I was there for quite some time and while I was playing weddings as well. And then um, yeah, it was getting time to move on in my career. So I took a, uh, I noticed that one of the violin string manufacturers was in Northport, New York, which was not too far from me. So I took a, a position with them. And when I got there, um, I just, because I was a guitar player, I, I understood the physics of a string and I could explain it pretty well. And the gentleman who ran the shop, his name was uh, Bob Nordenholtz. And he supplied pretty much all the New York City luthiers for years with violin strings. And Bob was like pretty amazed at how much I understood about strings and started teaching me about strings. And um, one of the things about gut strings is sometimes they come in what we call gauges, so different thicknesses, and each string could have five different thicknesses. And Bob would literally stop me in the aisle and go, you you know, one of our brands, Eudoxa Violin A's, name the gauges. And I'd have to just name the gauges. And it wasn't until I was able to memorize everything that he would let, you know, it was kind of the old apprenticeship. So until I memorized all the strings. And then once Bob retired and I started doing more, I started working with all the major um, violin, you know, violin stream makers, and they started sending their R&D guys to speak to me because when they released new R&D being wanted, research and development? Yeah, R&D, they're okay. research and development guys. So and so they would, anytime they announced the new string, they would, their research and development head uh, would come to me and, and, and tell me about, you know, the new string and what they were doing with it. And then I can, you know, talk to the customers about it. And after a while, um, Perastra was like, Ed really knows a lot about strings. And uh, he speaks about them so well that, they, you know, they brought me on. Um, and that was about eight years ago already. So mm -hmm. and being very German, I got the email that literally said, we will hire you. <laughs> <laughs> um, you triggered something. I am a clarinet guy. We are as fetishistic and especially oboe players more than anyone else about our reeds. Yeah. as are string players about their strings. And I just thought of an oboe player. I'm going to have her on sometime and to talk about reeds in mm -hmm. addition to everything else. And um, But also, I just thought of something, tune of the, tuning the orchestra, that the orchestra tunes sometimes with the violin, sometimes mm -hmm. with the oboe, and sometimes with the piano. I wonder why. Do you know? It's okay if you don't, because I don't know. No, either. I don't. I'm going to be honest. Yeah. I'll ask my <laughs> oboe friend. Um, who is the market? for Parastro strings, both in America and elsewhere. I will just say that your website is in three languages, German, yes, English, and Korean. Korean, yep. Um, yeah. yeah, the Asia market has grown uh, tremendously in the last few years. Um, they've really embraced classical music. Um, Japan is one of our biggest markets. Korea is one of our biggest markets. Um, the United States, of course, is, is a huge market as well as Europe. But um, our in Europe, you know, we will go anywhere from like a student level instrument all the way, you know, uh, all the way to professionals. But in the United States, for the most part, we're, you know, basically to the professional musicians. Um, you know, some of our, you know, in, in the United States, you got school budgets that can be, you know, pretty low for, for a violin string. So, you know, a lot of the times they'll go with cheaper options because our strings are made in Germany. They can be, you know, a little bit more, um, a little bit more expensive, but not, you know, not, we, we do make affordable strings, but, you know, it's hard to get those on the school bids. So for our, for us, I mean, you know, the symphony orchestras are, are definitely by far our biggest, you know, the professional musicians are, are our biggest clientele. Well, this invites the inevitable question. I don't like talking about money, but since you're talking about affordability, Talk about the range of cost from the school strings. Um, and do you buy one string? Do you buy a set of four? How does that happen? Just talk about if someone yeah. walked into the David Siegel violin shop yes. and said, so, I need strings for my violin. So, yeah, if a student walks in, you know, because we were talking uh, before, you know, with the different cores, um, the steel core strings are actually still, still by far the cheapest. Um, and the... The advantages they have is they stay in tune forever. So an orchestra teacher can go through the whole orchestra, tune everybody up, and then get back and not have to worry about the tune of a string, tuning the strings again. Where, you know, we were talking about nylon before. 
it wasn't until we were able to get nylon really thin and have like different little fibers or hairs of nylon that we're able to turn it into an orchestral string because then we can really get it back to having that torsional resistance we were talking about. So that's how thin, the, can you see on this picture, how thin mm -hmm. the core of a, of, yep. a, of, a, of a violin string can be in nylon. So imagine that'll just keep stretching. So, you know, professionals and especially gut strings stretch a lot. So tuning is always an issue. So for students, student strings like um, steel core strings, they'll be in, in the, you know, the, the $20 range mm -hmm. for a full violin set and work their way off a viola and cello. For four strings. $20 for four strings. For four strings. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, what people don't realize is a lot more goes into a violin string than goes into, like, let's say, a guitar string. A guitar string is literally just that one piece of steel is the core, mm -hmm. and then what we call one outer wrap. So they just wind, and that's it. That's a guitar string. That's why guitar strings will cost the player eight to ten bucks, depending on the uh, okay. on the quality of the string. Where violin strings, um, you can spend well over a hundred dollars for a set of violin strings mm -hmm. uh, on the on the higher end. Um, just the A string, which is, you know, one of the, the, the two thinner strings on a violin is literally that core and then two outer wraps. So there's way more and double bass strings can have up to nine layers of wraps for, for each string. So there's a lot of variation in the strings. A lot more goes into orchestral strings than goes into the guitar strings. So that is why the price of the strings uh, goes up dramatically. Um, you know, so a violinist, you can expect to spend as little as 20. Um, a professional player can get away, um, not get away, but any player can make anything sound, a good player can make any string sound good. You know, if Finn played on steel core strings, he'd still make them sound good. Um, but um, professional players will use like a nylon core string, which can be in the 40 to $50 range, sometimes up to 60. But there's a new synthetic that came out around 1996 or so, um, a gentleman, um, it was actually, the name of this material is called Peak. Um, and that's what we're using on all of our modern strings. It was actually developed by a gentleman named Norman Pickering. He's from Long Island, mm -hmm. um, but he worked for NASA and he invented this synthetic that resists heat and friction. So him being a hobbyist was like, hmm, heat and friction, that's what a bow does to a, uh, to a string so this is going to make a great string and and that's what a lot of the modern strings are made out of and they tend to be the more expensive ones other than the gut strings which can be really expensive depending how like do you a spell gut base string is very expensive <laughs> how do you spell peak um it's actually an ac it's acronym it's short for polyether ether ketone i don't know what that means so it's p-e-e-k -E -E okay okay yeah. polyether ether ketone uh -huh. <laughs> So and that how was from long, Mormon, so <laughs> I know we're talking a range of quality and such, but how long does the string last? Uh, it depends on again on the player. Um, you know, professional violinists will get, you know, if they're practicing all the time, they'll get it about three months out of a set of strings, you know, uh, and then if you're playing less, you can get six months to a year, you know, depending on how well you take care of them, if you clean them mm -hmm. off and if you know, yep. don't let the rods and build up on it and stuff. Cellists are, are kind of strange. Uh, violists and violinists are about the same three to six months, yep. depending on, on you know, how much they're playing. Cellists have a unique problem on their instruments. They have um, two different cores on their, on, like violin is basically, you know, one core across all the strings, except for the east, except for the top string. Cellist, the lower strings will last a lot longer than the top strings. They'll wear out the top strings quite a bit faster. So the A and D are actually a solid steel core a lot of times on a cello. And the bottom strings are actually the row core that I showed you before. Mm -hmm. So their bottom strings will last quite a bit longer. Most cellists will get about six months out of a set of cello strings. And cello strings happen to be more expensive than any of the other orchestral instruments because a lot of the cello G and C strings are made out of stuff like silver and tungsten. So more expensive materials were double bass strings you would think would be more expensive because they're bigger and thicker, but mm -hmm. they're made with solid uh, stainless steel instead of the, the precious metals because, you know, to use that much silver would just be too expensive. Yeah. Um, 
So, but double bass players, I've heard double bass players use strings for at least a year. And then you get some players like, oh, you know, like the old jazz guys. Oh, I've had those on about seven years. It's just, it depends on the player. Without naming specific musicians, because we don't have to, but do you find that there are musicians who have a definite preference for one of the materials? I mean, I know that people who play older music, for example, Baroque music, we understand that they prefer gut because that was what was used when that music was composed. Yeah, um, I can mention a a couple of cellists because I know, um, like one of our more famous endorsing artists is Stephen Israelis. Mm Mm-hmm the cellist, and he's always used our Eudoxa gut strings, always. Mm-hmm. Where, um, you know, going to another, Lynn Harrell, um, he's gone from gut, and he's used all of our versions of the steel core strings, even our newest string, the Perpetual for cello, he's yeah. used them all. So, okay. you know, it, it all depends on the player, and Lynn, Lynn adjusts, would adjust to the different strings, where Steve, Stephen Israel is, you know, is always used, you know, Eudox the gut strings. Okay. So my next question is, and, and I'm going to ask you to talk about it for a couple of minutes. Um, where do you see the future of the market for strings going? Is there a part of the world that can be developed more? You said about Asia, but in general, what's the future for strings? It's changing so much right now. It's it's um, we're seeing a whole lot of different uh, growth in a lot of different areas where um, one of the big changes right now is the electrified instruments. You know, um, right now, one of the most popular musics in the United States is country music. And we're getting a lot more electrified fiddle players who are, you know, uh, you know, touring and all that. And so they're using electrified instruments now. So that's changed the market quite a bit, um, you know, and, but it's, it's just growing and changing. So we're seeing a lot more inclusion in of different styles of music as well, where, you know, like, um, you know, people are more in tune to what's being played in movies. So soundtracks. Um, so, you know, you're getting a lot more different influences. So, you know, just influencing more kids, I think is, is, you know, and uh, kind of making classical music cool again. Mm-hmm. Um, had, you know, you'll, you, you, even at this point, you see where they'll play concerts with, they're playing entire scores of video game music at this point where, you know, they're just trying to influence more kids. But, um, you know, we've seen, like I said, tremendous growth in Asia. Um, Eastern Europe has grown quite a bit, but then, you know, all the new styles are coming up, you know, the interest in Celtic music, the interest in bluegrass and fiddle music. And then, you know, you also get, um, you know, all the different subgenres that are coming up with, you know, the electric violin and, you know, popular country music, everything has a fiddle. So, you know, you're getting a lot of that. And even you're starting to see it in, in rock music where um, one of the big concerts that's going on tours that you, every Christmas is that Trans-Siberian Orchestra, which is basically a large rock band. They have a string section. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's really growing and changing. So final question that <laughs> it dawned on me, but I, I guess the, because I'm not, I'm a wind guy. I don't know a lot of this other stuff. Piano strings, how are they different? Who makes them? Would Parastro make them or is that a whole other world? That's a whole other world because um, it's, they're sort of kind of like a harp string because harp strings are, you know, so they're round wound. So it's just, a, it's a round wire. And because the hammer hits it, they have to be, you know, a, instead of being plucked by, by your fingers, like a harp, you know, when you hit the piano key, it's a little hammer inside that hits it. So it's very, very specific where, um, so, and the thing about a piano string is because it's being hit in the same spot all the time, it, it you know, that has, they have to be developed that way where with bow strings, you know, people will adjust how they're playing. So that whole string is getting played. So it's a different technology um, where like harp players will kind of do a little bit with that, but it's not as harsh on the string as like a hammer consistently hitting the same string in the same spot. Um, so yeah, we do not make piano strings. 
you know, I believe it's all made by, you know, all the piano string makers like Steinway and, and all the, you know, the big ones, Baldwin. <laughs> I, I mean, it just struck me because my dad, he was a professional trombone player, but then when he retired from that, he learned to become an outstanding piano tuner. And tuner, I used to, yep. as a boy, go with him when he would tune pianos in places. And I remember this huge box of tools and he'd open the lid. It was kind of like a car mechanic going oh, in yeah. there and tuning everything. And it occurred to me with Finn just today that there are no violin tuners because musicians do it themselves, whereas pianists require someone yeah. to come in and tune for them. Yeah, the because you, you got to get in there. Yeah, and, and <laughs> if it's not in pitch, it, because with with violin or any of those other instruments, if you're at a key a little bit, you can slide up, <laughs> you know, and adjust. You can't adjust the piano, so piano has to be perfectly tuned, or else it's it's not going to play right. Um, yeah. It'll sound bad. Where with a violin or even a guitar or, or do the viola, cello, double bass, if you're a little out of tune and you hear it, you can actually adjust your fingers to you know, to get in tune. And I, I, as a guitar player, I'm going to ask you, the band that you sometimes see on, on guitars that looks like an orthopedic band that can be affixed and slid up and down. Do you know the thing I'm referring to? It's called the capo. <laughs> and what is it and why, how is it used and why? Okay. Um, as a jazz guitarist, we call that a cheat. <laughs> Okay. Um, I don't really use those. Uh, it's really popular with folk and country music. Um, basically, it's so you can bar the frets, so you can bar the guitar, so you can play your simple chords up and down the neck without having to adjust how you play. You know, um, being a, a, a classical guitar player or a jazz guitar player usually wouldn't use a capo because they would use their hands. Where you know, Bob Dylan is probably the best example of it bob dylan only knew three chords so if you wanted to change chords you would just slide the capo up oh what key oh you want an a so he just slide the capo up to a and then play the same three chords that's how do that's you spell capo uh, c-a-p-o capo c-a-p-o oh yep capo yeah and yeah they've been around forever <laughs> okay well it uh, started on banjos to be honest oh really yeah and did, then when did the i leave anything out that i should have asked you that you uh, I just wanted to kind of go over one kind of fun thing about some yeah. facts about, you know, we were talking about how it's a sixth generation family owned business. And uh, what one of the nice things about working with Parastro is how much of a family oriented business they are. And one of our famous brands is Ava Parazzi. So Ava is the current, uh, well, her daughter and her son, her, her son Henning and her, her daughter Annetta have taken over the business now. But Ava, um, you know, um, you know, took over the business around 1992. But um, one of our famous brands now is Ava Parazzi. And what's known is this really pretty iconic package. You mm -hmm. see that? That's like, you know, and what people don't realize is her husband Volker actually drew this picture of her. So it's like a very personal family thing. But um, as you can see, the name Ava is spelled E-V-A-H instead of E-V-A. Mm -hmm. Her name is E-V-A. Um, and one of the uh, fun things about it, and a lot of people don't realize, this is actually the family initials. It's Ava for you know, E for Ava, V for her husband Volker, A for her daughter Annetta, and H for her son Henning. It's you know, so it's a very personalized, um, very still a family-run business, and they try to run it, you know, as like, you know, to have a very personal feel, which I, I think is really nice. Very good. Well, Ed Mingo, thank you very, very much for all that you've taught me and us, our <laughs> listeners around the world today. And good You're luck. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. Take care.